Hello and welcome to Bharat Shakti dot in. I am Brigadier Chatterjee. We are going to be talking about nuclear issues today. Almost eight decades back, two cities in Japan almost disappeared: Hiroshima and Nagasaki. To be precise, more precise, August of 1945. After that, there were, have been quite a few agreements to limit the use, limit the number of nuclear warheads that any country can have. But today again, we have reached a stage. Where perhaps not none of these arrangements are really tenable. Uh, we have the start having been overtaken by New Start, and New Start today is in a state of suspended animation. I would say. To discuss the issue, I have with me Dr. Manpreet Sidi. Welcome, Dr. Manpreet Sidi. Thank you so uh, much, sir. She is with the uh, Center for Air Power Studies now, and uh, she is also oh, a research scholar, a scholar, uh, an editor, a writer. And a speaker on nuclear issues all over the world. Welcome. Uh, the first issue, in case you want, you can I can start off with it. Is that the new start? You know, like I say, say, I do not know how far is Putin committed to it right now, and I don't know how long will this status last, as long as the war with Ukraine carries on. Mm. So, under the circumstances, what's your opinion? Uh, will they get back to the treaty? Will China also? Uh, walk in to walk in and possibly discuss issues with Russia and US. They have not been coming so far. What's your opinion, really? I think at this moment, as you said, it's in a st new start treaty is in a state of suspended animation because uh, the Russians uh, moved out of the treaty or suspended the treaty in uh, Feb in February this year. I think it was exactly to mark one year of the start of the conflict with Ukraine. That President Putin announced that uh, you know New Start will will they are suspending their membership of New Start, and in June this year, uh, the U.S. has now come up with some countermeasures uh, against this. So we do see a state where New Start perhaps will not uh, exist in the form that we've seen it in the past, and with the end of New Start, we are seeing the end of arms control as we have known from the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. I think after the Cuban Missile Crisis, the understanding in, in U.S. and in Soviet Union at that time was you have to build stability because both of them had come to the brink of a nuclear war and wanted to establish stability. And the idea then was to rationalize the nuclear numbers that they have. We seem to have reached a stage where just these two actors are not the primary nuclear reactors and uh, nuclear actors any longer. There are nine countries with nuclear weapons today. And uh, China, particularly, is rapidly increasing. So the last American nuclear security strategy has spoken about China as a near competitor uh, on the nuclear front, and therefore the U.S. is very keen that China must be involved in future arms control. But as we know, China has said they are not interested in any arms control. In fact, we are seeing expanding numbers, uh, warhead numbers, in the case of China right now. So we are seeing a stage or a pause in arms control at this moment. Until the relationships between different countries become less stressed than what they seem to be at this moment in time, I don't see arms control being, uh, you know, in the conversations for now. And even then, the arms control of the future will have to be quite different from what the ceilings-based approach or the numbers-based approach was, because there are huge asymmetries in numbers with the new players that will have to be included in arms control of the future. So, you, I mean, do you look at it in the same way that the Ukraine war has to actually stop, perhaps, or there has to be some sort of a progress in terms of uh, stopping the conflict? Unless, unless. Otherwise, uh, Russia is not going to walk, uh, really walk into any kind of an arrangement, whether it's new or old. Absolutely. I mean, you don't see the U.S. and the Russians coming to speak on the table on nuclear issues till the political relationship between the two improves to some extent, and that can only happen. If this conflict is resolved with, uh, with a with a perspective where both sides think they have gained something by so. by stopping it, uh, right? You're talking about numbers. What about the Chinese? I believe the arsenal is growing quite a uh, fast rapidly. Rate now. Yes. So what's the status really now? So the status is not brought out by the Chinese in any official numbers that they disclose. But there are various organizations that come up with guesstimates of what the Chinese numbers are. And based on those guesstimates, which are also coming from the U.S. Department of Defense, the reports that come out annually from the American uh, Pentagon uh, are also indicating that the numbers are increasing. 
but I don't put all my bets on just on those reports because the Americans have been saying that the numbers are increasing for a long period of time. For the last 20 years, they've been saying the numbers are going up to 1,000, 1,500. But we didn't see that happen in China. In fact, China believed that sufficiency of numbers, as long as you can do unacceptable damage, is what they wanted to keep. But today's China seems to be different for various reasons. And I think from the security dimension, they are increasing their numbers to saturate or defeat the missile defense of the U.S. because that's a concern for them with small numbers. And the other thing is also for status. Uh, Xi Jinping seems to have arrived at the conclusion that there has to be parity in numbers of sorts in order to have a relationship of equal strength with the U.S., so you are seeing this increase in numbers in the Chinese arsenal today. So according to current estimates, the warheads have gone up to 410. They are increasing quite rapidly. In fact, the, it, it is the largest growing or the fastest growing arsenal at this moment in time, and which used to be a, a, a status that Pakistan enjoyed for a long period of time. So the Chinese have actually upgraded themselves here. Uh, and we are seeing that with one missile being able to carry multiple warheads, those numbers are certainly going up in the Chinese arsenal. You know, there's a, a great longing for numbers in the business of nuclear warfare. My own feeling is that once you have number when uh, less is enough, why have more? An old statement perhaps by an Indian chief, Jan Sundati. Uh, so, uh, where is the requirement? Is the, does that really hold true in Jan Sundati's statement? If less is enough, well, why have more? After all, what is required is better delivery means we can get across the air defense systems of your targeted country and deliver. Uh, whether you deliver one or you deliver a couple of them, actually you've done your job as far as delivery is concerned. Yeah, no, given that this is a weapon of mass destruction, uh, numbers have really should not be the focus no of attention. St status, like but, you said. Yeah, but unfortunately, I mean, it depends on what kind of a strategy are you following uh, of deterrence. Nuclear weapons are seen to be deterrence weapons. But if you follow a strategy of deterrence by denial, where you think war fighting with nuclear weapons can happen, then interest in numbers goes up, which is what we see between US and USSR of the Cold War period, where the focus was on numbers. So they ended up building as many as 50, 60,000 nuclear weapons before they started rationalizing with the arms control treaties that we spoke about. So the new start has capped the figures at 1550 okay. nuclear warheads and 700 missiles. But uh, the, the Chinese focus is coming from essentially to build that parity. So if they have to be involved in any arms control of the future, they want to come to a certain level so that they have enough to be able to give up as part of that arms control. But for India, for instance, the focus is not on numbers of warheads because we have a deterrence by punishment strategy which is to say that you do something to us, our retaliation will cause you unacceptable damage. And causing unacceptable damage with a weapon of mass destruction is really not very difficult. Uh, in fact, given the densities of population that we exist uh, you know, in our neighborhood, uh, no use of a nuclear weapon will not be an unacceptable damage. So therefore, I think India has kept itself very clear of this numbers game and, um, and maintain that as long as I have sufficient to cause unacceptable damage, that's what I'm going to focus on. Which is why, as you know, sir, the Indian nuclear doctrine is credible minimum deterrence. So the focus is not on building maximalist numbers because security and safety are also concerns that come with large arsenals. Of course. Uh, anyway, let's just switch a little bit. Uh, isn't this relationship between China and Russia, especially with the Ukraine war, and Russia finding itself cornered, they're getting closer and closer. To what extent has this extended to their war relationship even earlier, as far as nuclear weapons are concerned, as far as this delivery means are concerned? Is this going to accelerate? How do you read this? Between China and Russia? Russia. So in terms of their uh, help to each other, uh, we see, for instance, one clear example of the Russian help to China for its uh, improved early warning systems. And the fear that the U.S. has expressed if they were to have good early warning systems is the Chinese might want to move to launch on warning positions. So their arsenal, which is currently in a demated state or in less than hair trigger alert status, could be upgraded if they had this help of early warning, you know, good radar systems, ISR capability with the help of the Russians to the Chinese. So this is where the concern comes in. Uh, as far as, uh, I mean, some of the noises that we've heard from China 
counseling President Putin to say, don't go towards the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Nuclear war cannot be won and therefore should not be fought. All of that seems to indicate that China has reservations about uh, how Putin might want to use his nuclear weapons. Of course, uh, despite all the noises that we've seen come out from Russia on drawing attention to their nuclear weapons, the use of the weapon has not happened. And we are, you know, more than 540 days into this conflict by now. Uh, so the relevance of that remains low. But uh, whether that relationship or cooperation at the technical level uh, will still be existing between Russia and China, if, and if either side has much to gain from each other's technicalities, I think it will happen under the carpet, not so much in the open domain. So I guess the relationship will get stronger. Uh, I mean, they, Russia is going to be more and more dependent on China, so obviously, and they'll also make more, have to give more of technology, like you're saying, mm -hmm. to the Chinese and the bargain. That seems to be the, the normal sort of barter arrangement that the two will have to get into. Uh, and if they have a common enemy in the U.S., then this, there is a rationale for this strategic relationship will, which will continue. Right. Uh, one more question, and this is about tactical nuclear weapons. You know, there's been a lot of saber rattling, whether you're talking about Ukraine or otherwise Pakistani you politicians do it once in a while, even you find the North Koreans, of course, uh, doing it more often than even the Pakistanis do. But uh, there's nothing called a limited conflict when it comes to using a small nuclear weapon, whether it's tactical or not. Uh, and wherever you use it, it's a spiral which will go up. Mm -hmm. So, actually, is this uh, saber rattling going to help really, and or let's say threatening to use a tactical nuclear weapon really sensible approach for any country? Well, saber rattling helps to the extent of uh, uh, shaping the contour of the conflict. So, the Russian noises on tactical nuclear weapons, including placement of these weapons in Belarus right now, yeah. essentially has been to to signal to the U.S. and to NATO that beyond a point, you will not get involved in this conflict. And we did see that they managed to, you know, uh, keep several kinds of weapon systems out from the US and NATO to be given to Ukraine because of the kind of saber rattling. So the political value of saber rattling is definitely there. Uh, but uh, I don't think the use of the weapon is ever going to get you to a useful military or a political objective, which is what we have seen in this conflict also. Despite the U.S. feeling that uh, Russia is on the, uh, you know, on the verge of using its nuclear weapons, it hasn't been so easy because somebody who breaches that norm of non-use, which has now existed since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, is going to really let out something which is very different from what all kinds of conflicts have been. So it's a huge weight for a leader to carry to get to that first use of nuclear weapon. Also, you have to identify what will be the best target to use it. In the case of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, where would they want to use that nuclear weapon? In Ukraine, that they want to annex? Or will it be outside the theater, which then means bringing on the wrath of uh, NATO and the US? So, uh, uh, which will be the best time to use it? Because again, the US said Moscow was sunk, now they're going to use it. Kremlin was attacked, now they're going to use it. So, but... But for countries, there is a huge space uh, before you would get to the use of nuclear weapons. So I think tactical nuclear weapons is a concept. Uh, projection of irrationality helps you in deterrence. But beyond that, uh, the value of this weapon, the military value of this weapon, uh, stands seriously uh, sort of uh, in question. Uh, last que question, then. This is about uh, our own no first use kind of a thing that we have in our doctrine. Uh, is this a tenable doctrine or do we need a change with seeing the circumstances all around? So, uh, according to my understanding, sir, NFU, No First Use of India, is a very sane and a stabilizing uh, doctrine and strategy to have. What India is signaling is we will not be the first to introduce nuclear weapons because, as I mentioned to you, preemptive use of nuclear weapons raises a whole set of questions which are very difficult for any political leader to uh, try to get into. Uh, also, no first use eases the requirement of the kind of arsenal that we need to build. With a first use uh, doctrine, you would need a credibility of an arsenal which would allow you to do first strike uh, and be meaningful with that first strike. Uh, so we have eased ourselves on many fronts by having a no first use doctrine. It's liberated our political leadership, it's liberated our arsenal requirements, and it has helped us to... Uh, 
uh, spend that money more effectively on conventional deterrence, which is really what we need uh, to buttress rather than overspend and uh, get into more difficult situations with the idea of a first use. So no first use has given us space. It has uh, provided us with an adversary which need not be on the edge. And with nuclear weapons, you don't want a panicking adversary. You want somebody who understands that you will not take a call. Uh, it's up to him. And we are signaling retaliation, which would cause unacceptable damage with that no first use strategy. So you try using, you might define it as tactical or anything else. Uh, the response from India would be to cause massive retaliation. Uh, no first use is also with the Chinese. They also use it in their doctrine. So in a way, we are quite safe also that, let's say, the major enemy is not really going to be the first one to use or that's what he promises. Of course, it's not there for the Pakistani. Yes. So the only two countries that have a no first use doctrine are India and China. And I think the value of that shows out, and I wish it would be replicated in other dyads as well, is that you have been in a state of standoff with the Chinese for the last three years now, and the nuclear word has not been spoken. Whereas in the case of Pakistan, every time a conflict breaks out between the two countries, the first thing they do is start talking about the nuclear yeah. saber rattling, as you just said earlier. So I think with a no first use doctrine, there is a certain sense of stability that comes in, which is an effective way of handling it. Because the use of the weapon, when the other side has a robust check and strike capability, is certainly not going to get us any benefits. Right. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Manpreet. So nice of you to have found time for us in Bharat Sakhi. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you, viewers. Thanks for joining us. Do log in now and then and you'll find such interesting stories. Also, go to our social media pages. Thank you.